can all just keep our activism on Facebook and Twitter. Okay. It was May Day, 2015, and we were doing a march from Portland State University to come up and meet the main May Day march. Some of y'all may remember that day. It's very controversial. But uh, we were representing for uh, black lives that had been taken, taken earlier that year. Baltimore was in open rebellion, and we were doing our part to be in solidarity with it. Olivia just happened to come to that march that day, and it was a day that changed my life. And that was the day when one of your community leaders, damn, one of your community leaders was born. This is Olivia. Hi everybody, my name is Olivia Pace. I'm a member of Socialist Alternative and I work with Don't Shoot Portland. Socialist Alternative has a booth with some lovely, lovely, lovely women of color giving you all kinds of literature, papers, flyers. Um, in Socialist Alternative, we are trying to wage a struggle to dismantle this evil capitalist system that exploits all of us. But then, yeah, it does. But the reason we're out here today even though in this country right now, the capacity for unions to have general strikes, the capacity for workers to really stand up to their bosses is very low. The reason we're out here today, despite that, is to say that women and people in feminized bodies labor, our labor is the backbone of this society. <laughs> Historically, right, we go, we go home, we take care of your children, we cook your food, we do all of the things that make the society work. This work is not inconsequential, but it has been pushed onto women through this capitalist system and through neoliberalism that says, you take care of yourself, your family, and then you go to work and you toil and you make the money for the 1% of the top, when they should be supporting us because we make the society work. Thank you. <laughs> and so if there's one thing that I would want you to take away from today, is even though our capacity right now as workers is, is, is lower than we would like it, go back to your workplaces and, and think critically about how, much you're, about how much you're being paid, how you're being treated, if what you're getting is good enough, even if you have a job that you consider good. Our standards for how we should be treated under capitalism, for how much we should be compensated for our work, for the value of our labor, are, is so low. We are taught that just having a job, having some kind of penance from the 1% is enough. It is not enough. So take away from today, join your union. If you don't, if you aren't, if you don't have a union at your workplace, talk to the people in your workplace. Figure out what what can what can be given to you. Figure out how much your labor is worth and how much you should be valued in your workplace. What you have right now is not enough. That's why we're out here today, especially if you're a woman, if you're in a feminized body. You, we build the society. We make it work. And now, under neoliberalism, we go to work and we're told that we should work even harder than we already have historically. So what we have right now is not enough. So I'm so glad that all of you are out here today to highlight that. Um, so now I'm going to introduce um, our next speaker. Her name is Lila. She is lovely. She is a social worker and a community organizer. And she has some lovely, lovely words for you. Here you go. Thank you. I'm not advanced like them. Uh, I got I gotta no. I gotta read off my, no, my thing. Here. Here. It doesn't matter, you're a woman, you got something to say. Yeah! Yeah! Th Lila. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for making space for me today. Uh, before I dive in, I, I do want to include a like a brief content warning and disclaimer. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about sex work, rape, sex trafficking, police and gun violence, among other things. Um, I wanna I want folks to have a choice in their exposure to that triggering material. Um, I would also ask that you hold some space for me. This is actually my, my first time uh, talking about this material publicly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I think these stories really need to be heard. So thanks so much for making the space. Um, so I clearly spent a lot of time uh, th talking about labor. Uh, and today I am using this space to talk about some of the most vulnerable and marginalized workers in our society. I'm talking about sex workers. We're, we're so fortunate to live in a time where conversations about oppression in the context of work are common, but tell me, who is holding space for sex workers in these discussions? 
There is endless debate about the indignity of unpaid emotional labor, but when someone sells their time or their ass for money, they're somehow illegitimate? How does that math add up? Sex workers don't have to be students or single mothers to be justified in the way they earn their living. Sex workers are people, and if your feminism gets hung up on the construct of choice or empowerment in the matter, you're missing the fucking point. In our society, some labor is valued and some labor is not. Some voices are invited into the public sphere, while others are silenced. We need to ask ourselves, whose narratives are we comfortable with? Whose stories are getting erased? Whose issues ultimately matter? Whose problems are worthy of solutions? I'm talking about visibility, knowledge, and privilege, and there are real life stakes to our refusal to ask ourselves these questions. Sex workers of color, particularly those who are queer and trans identified, are, are losing their lives because of our refusal to ask ourselves these questions. I didn't even realize I was a survivor of sex trafficking until I was getting my master's degree nearly 10 years after the fact. Up until that point, I, I just thought about it as that time when, you know, the cops confiscated my money and threatened to arrest me after I was raped and robbed a few times. You know, sometimes at gunpoint. Sorry. I just thought this is what happened to girls like me, black and brown girls who have no other way to put a roof over our heads, the kind of girls that nobody misses, the ones who have no one waiting for them at home. I literally lacked the knowledge and experience to understand. I lacked the vocabulary to talk about what really happened. And all of this begs a really serious question. What do we do when people use the wrong words to discuss sensitive issues? Do we meet them with patience and empathy? Are they invited in? Or do we cut them out of the discussion completely? When we choose control and righteousness, how are we complicit in the silencing of marginalized and vulnerable people? Despite our differences, I, I know that every single person here today uh, values equity and social justice. It's, it's truly inspiring the way, the way you're all showing up when I know there, there are easier choices to make. I just want to say that I see you. <laughs> we, we need each other to create the changes we're trying to see. We need to learn how to meet each other with that kind of understanding. Uh, we need to figure out how to lift each other up, not, not tear each other down. We must find ways to hold each other accountable with shutting down the process. We have to figure out how to hold our mission-driven organizations and institutional in institutions accountable with, without getting in our own way. I have really high hopes that we can get there. Yes. Finally, I just want to lift up the work of Matilda Bickers and, and Stroll PDX. Stroll PDX is a harm reduction, outreach, and education group run by and for sex workers. Stroll PDX centers the narratives of sex workers of color, particularly those who are queer and trans identified. They're out in the street, they're out at the state capitol doing really important work. I hope that you can go and support them. Thank you so much for the space and time. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna try to be fast because I think we're running out of time. My name is Ray. Oh, right here. Okay. This is my first time ever speaking in public. <laughs> um, I'm a stay-at-home mom to four children. I'm married, and I've been a volunteer activist with Family Forward and other groups for several years. Uh, today, I want to talk about capitalism. It's a system that reduces all human interaction and decisions into economic transactions. In theory, the invisible hand of the market is supposed to make for a fair society. But that's bullshit. Cap <laughs> Capitalism is dependent on an entirely different invisible force. It's a force that's kept purposely invisible so that powerful people can tell themselves that they are self-made. Powerful men are especially enamored with this myth. They would have us believe that they pulled themselves out of the womb by their own bootstraps. <laughs> Capitalism exploits many, but I'm here to address one aspect that I became aware of soon after becoming a mother. That's caregiving. 
Without the key component of caregiving, our country, and in fact our entire civilization, would collapse. The essential and powerful acts of raising children and caring for the sick and the elderly have been assigned little to no value in our economy. Often this work is totally unpaid, and the majority of it is done by women. When the work is paid, the majority of it is still worked by women, and it's compensated at poverty level wages. Caregiving makes society possible at the most basic levels, yet it's taken for granted to the point of an invisibility. Can you imagine how long our species would have lasted if women gave birth and simply walked away to care for themselves alone? But that's not what mothers do. We give up years of our lives to care for our families and others. And how are we repaid for that service to our society? By living in a country where becoming a mother is one of the leading predictors of living in poverty and old age. Caregiving is often a labor of love, but it is still valuable labor. Whether you are a stay-at-home mom, a daycare provider, a home health nurse, or in any other position where you provide care for others, let's stand together and demand that our care is recognized as the essential work that it is and demand the compensation that we deserve. A small start to that compensation would be passing the Family Act. This bill would provide 12 to 18 weeks of paid family medical leave. That's to care for a new baby, a sick family member, be with someone at the end of their life, and it covers both biological and chosen family members. It, <laughs> it even covers yourself if you are dealing with serious illness. This bill sets up an insurance fund paid by employers and employees equally at 0.5%. It's not the most progressive bill, but it is a step in the right direction towards recognizing caregiving. As long as we keep pressure on our legislators in Oregon, we do believe it will pass in the next session. If this is important to you, please find out how you can help this bill pass by visiting timefororegon.org or familyforwardaction.org, or you can come talk to me about it at any time and I'll help you get involved. Thank you. Her first time ever speaking! Come on! Thank you. Yes. Okay. Reproductive labor makes the world go round. Okay. So, uh, I just want to let everybody know one more time that uh, the balloons are for the kids. If there are any kids that just showed up, you can absolutely come down and get one so that uh, we don't lose you. We want to make sure that everybody stays safe. Uh, and I just want to say that uh, if anyone has um, any sort of hearing stuff, if you if you are with someone who does, I just want to make sure that they can see that we have a, a sign language interpreter here. So thank you very, very much for doing this work. We also have security. They have, they have yellow armbands. If you uh, see someone with a yellow armband, y'all can maybe raise your hands and show your yellow armbands. They're here to keep us safe. They're all around. We know that the fash likes to play around. We're not playing with you. Um, and uh, the, the National Lawyers Guild Legal Observers. Yes, thank you very much. The National Lawyers Guild. Legal Observers will be here to make sure that the cops don't pull no shit. Okay. So one of the organizations that helped us, uh, bottom line, a lot of this that we're very thankful for, they're streaming this right now. They brought the, uh, the, the mic that we're using, the Democratic Socialists of America. Woo! This is one of the fastest organizations in the country and in the world, and we say congratulations. We need you to do the work. Push everybody to the left inside. Yeah. Uh, and um, I want to say that we have uh, buckets going around that also uh, will be... Um, uh, sent around so if you have the capacity help us keep our work sustainable and don't shoot Portland uh, and uh, we have someone from the DSA right now Abby who's gonna share a couple of words with you all thank y'all okay thank you hi my name is Abby and I'm a member of Portland Democratic Socialist of America I'm also a student at Portland State University and the chair of the Young Democratic Socialist of America I'm a student a worker, a woman, and a person of color. I'm a proud socialist. I, be I believe that capitalism works to undermine the 99% by exploiting women and people of color. Women's rights are under attack. 
Domestic work is overlooked and underpaid. They talk about our bodies like pawns in a game, ready to sacrifice our health care for a tax break. Accusations of harassment and sexual violence have bubbled to the surface. But even the Me Too movement prioritizes the voices of the rich and the white. We are not silent by choice, but silenced by the hands of capitalism. Women and people of color have historically been at the forefront of social change in our country. From black women ensuring the success of the Black Belt Communist organizing in Alabama in the 30s, to black women organizing to keep a pedophile out of office just last year in Alabama. <laughs> women of color are the backbone, the core, and the heart of this woman or of this movement. And I'm standing in front of you now because I believe in a socialist future. A future without exploitation um, and oppression in all its forms. A future for people, not for profits. It is that idea that leads women, the people of color, the workers, the youth, the undocumented, the 99% to continue to fight. We want health care and free college for all. We want the Clean Dream Act passed now and amnesty for all. We want to live in a world without borders because no human is illegal on stolen land. Our worth is not defined by our capacity to produce an output. We are fighting for a system that values us as humans and not dollar signs because the future is dictated by the present and we are not and we are done fighting for crumbs. We won't stop until we get the slice of cake. They can try to divide us, but we will rise and unify, and unified, we're gonna win. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, next we have a member of the International Socialist Organization. Her name is Yasmin Ayou. She is a revolutionary, badass Palestinian student activist. She is one of my very good friends, and she has some very powerful words for you. So here she is. Thank you. Cool, cool. Hello, Portland. Thank you for coming out today to participate in this socialist tradition. Um, my name is Yasmin Ayub. I'm a Palestinian woman, and I'm in the International Socialist Org and Occupation Free Portland. Today and on this day since 1909, we have striked to illuminate the flaws in this system. We have striked to demand change for the improvement of our own lives as we struggle under capitalism. We strike as not only women, but as proletariat. Yeah. Okay. But not everyone, not every woman can be with us today in this strike. There are women who across the globe can't leave work for fear of being fired, assaulted, for fear of things that many women in this country wouldn't think of. But, to the, real but the reality is not only for women here, but across the globe. Okay. Today in Palestine, women are functioning under the same occupation-stricken world as they have since 1947. Palestinian women everywhere in this world feel this and we carry it for the generations to come and the ones that have gone. We fight and we strike not just for equal pay or equal rights or equal opportunity. We strike to illuminate the fights that our lives are consumed by under this system and furthermore under the occupation of Palestine that has come with that. Yeah, okay. Today in Palestine, Ahed Tamimi is in prison. Free Ahed! Yeah, free Ahed! Yeah, thank you. She is one of over 300 Palestinian children who are in Israeli military custody. Ahed turned 17 in prison last month. She is there for a hitting an Israeli soldier. She has been in prison since December. Ahed's fight is all of our fights. This young woman has been fighting since she was a young girl. 
Her whole life has been the struggle under the system and under the occupation. Israel is an apartheid state. Ahed's life has been nothing but fighting for our homeland, our livelihood, our right to survive as more than refugees, immigrants, and second-class citizens. Her mother and her cousin have joined her in prison sense. Today, across the globe, we strike against the system that fuels the apartheid state of Israel. We strike against lifetimes, generations, centuries of struggling under capitalism. Today, whether you knew it or not, you are striking for Ahed Tamimi. You can do this every day if you so choose to join myself and others in the BDS movement and further the socialist proletarian movement. <laughs> Joining us in boycotting the apartheid state of Israel. Yes. The system is murderous. It, is, it thrives on oppression. It is ruthless. It is time for us to wake and rise. Another world is necessary for us, for women, and everyone else, everywhere else, for Palestine. Thank you and solidarity. Thank you, Yasmin. Our next speaker is Maria Garcia, running for county commissioner in District 2. So if you can, in the coming election, vote for her, because she is going to change the city, and she has something to say to you today. All right, Maria. Hola, buenas tardes. So quiero honrar mi madre lengua, que es el español hoy. Como la mujer que soy, mi madre lengua se merece respeto. Right. Y si no lo entienden, es porque no han realmente crecido con la comunidad inmigrante. Si no hablan el español, si no lo entienden, es tiempo ahorita de que empecemos a cambiar. So a lot of you didn't probably understand, right, what I say. That's how we feel sometimes when we speak to our representatives, when we speak to our brothers and sisters that are being whitewashed and they're tokenizing us. It's how we feel. You're not listening. I feel like you're speaking a different language. Yes. yes, I do have an accent, but guess why? Because I am an immigrant. Yes. And my accent, my accent is telling you where I'm from. I'm from Mexico City. I know what it is to be undocumented. I know what it is to work up to three jobs. I know what it is not to be able to communicate what I really wanted to say in a courtroom and having legal representation that incorrectly translated what I said. I know what it is not to be the parent that I wanted to be. And I was 16 years old when I had my daughter. Since then, I'm not gonna tell you my age, but <laughs> since then, I'm still young. You are not the wrong problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's been challenge after challenge after challenge, right? That's called life. And you know why? Because we have full lives. We are able to have problems and solve them. Woo! I learned that. I learned that we have to face our obstacles. I learned that even though sometimes we don't have the right translation, the right support, we don't have the money, we don't have much. But when you have dignity, when you have ethics, when you really feel in your heart that the bullshit life that they're giving us is destroying us, and I'm sorry for my French. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm tired, estoy cansada. Es injusto. This is unfair. And when I'm talking about standing with immigrants, I really mean it. I really mean it. My employee, one employee from El Salvador, Carmen. By the way, I have a restaurant a few weeks, I mean, <laughs> a few walks from here. <laughs> Revolución Coffee House. 
Revolución, Cajijas. My girl, my lady, Carmen, from El Salvador. Her brother was detained in Tijuana. It's a long story. They had to get him out from El Salvador because they fear for his life. And we make phone calls to different family members. I have a lot of cousins all over Mexico, even Chiapas and you name it, calling people. Can you take care of this man? Can you take care of this man? Can you take care of this man? Yes, you know? We help him to go through the whole country. Then he gets detained. Now he's in Texas. They need to raise $20,000 to get him out and continue with his legal process of uh, asylum, right? Carmen had an accident on Christmas week, you know, when we had the snow. She broke her arm. So I'm campaigning. I'm taking care of my business, now I have to cook, now all these problems, one thing after another, one thing after another, I was feeling like I was getting a heart attack. Why? Because of the amount of pressure. Because my lady, my employee, the one that is a big, big, important part of my business, yes, because we sell, by the way, tamales, <laughs> <laughs> and pupusas, and she makes them, right? She makes them. And if I don't have that lady working for me, then it means that I have to change my menu. Then it means that I have to look for another employee. And the change, I mean, the flavor is going to change. And you know what I'm saying? Affects my business. Affects my business. But, you know, she's doing well now. Finally, she got the help that she needed. She got the loan that she needed. I couldn't help her because I have my own struggles too. Right? This is our life. Every day, full of experiences, full of obstacles. But when you have dignity, when you have ethics, when you care about somebody else, you know what? Those things, you overcome them. You know how, you learn. It's where our strength is. In the very, very weakness time of your life, is where your strength is. Right there. And right now, we are feeling weak. We are feeling weak because we're being attacked. For us, for immigrants, this is no new. We have experienced this in this very toxic political climate since long, long, long time. But I say it's time to change it, and it's up to us. And that's why I decided to put my body into this really, really hard adventure in my life because this system is not built for us because every time I go to meet different unions different organizations every time I try to get an endorsement and I don't get them I don't see color in those political committees I don't see women I don't see people of color and that means that that has to change because they're not representing me. They're not representing Carmen. They're not representing anybody other than just a specific group of people. That has to change. And if we don't realize that the change has to take place now, we are going to continue having bigger and bigger problems. Now, if you're standing with immigrants, if you're standing with DACA, so then you help me to get there so I can advocate for them. Because we don't have courageous leaders to fight for us. And even with this accent, and even sometimes the words don't come out the way I want, because my heart speaks differently. And I want people to see that. I, I want them to see the value of who I am, what I do in the community. This sign was made outside my business. Don't shoot Portland. Yes. Because of that woman right there, Teresa Rayford. Yes. Because of her. Because of my sister, because of my hermana, Teresa, I am here. Somebody in city council told me, if you want to be here, 
you need to turn your back on activism. Why do I want to do that? You tell me who put you there. We put you there. Why am I going to turn my back on my sister and my brothers? Those that put me here is because of them that I'm here. Because of that, because she empowered me. Because this woman has opened so many doors for me and many doors for all of us. So I want to recognize my sister Teresa. I said we need some tequila to warm up. <laughs> so when I win, I'm gonna throw a big party. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. But, but I would like some tequila, yes. <laughs> so what I'm saying now is that I appreciate you're here. I appreciate we're having fun, we're exchanging stories. We are getting to know each other. But what's going to happen tomorrow? Because today we're here, we're gathering, it's beautiful. What's next? What's next? What's the follow-up of this? What's the follow-up of that? I've been living like this for 24 years, since I got to this country. So it's nice to read it, but when you live it every day, you get angry, you get disappointed <laughs> because you don't get help. And that means that you have to just kick those doors and open those doors yourself. Because this is not built for us. This system is not built for us. So you know what we do? You know what's happening tomorrow after this? We are gonna build our own platform. We are going to select who do we want to represent us. Because we're going to demand that we're here to demand, not to ask for permission. And until we don't get out of the thinking that we should ask for some compassion for our com uh, communities, things are not going to change. We are here. We're existing. We need to take those positions. So we need to know what's going on there that we don't know. So I'm asking you to please love each other, respect each other, support each other, and show your solidarity. Show your solidarity because that matters.